order members. That concludes questions to the Health Minister. We now move to questions to the Justice Minister. And I call Gregory Campbell. Mr. Campbell. Number one. Mr. Speaker, as I announced to the House on the 19th of March last year, and in a further statement on the 21st of October, I am committed to the redevelopment of McGilligan Prison. I noted in my response at question time on the 10th of June that NIPS officials are nearing completion of the outlined business case for the redevelopment, which will be submitted for approval within the next month. I said at that time that the completed outlined business case will be submitted to DFP, and it will be DFP's decision as to whether the business case will be approved for the rebuild. Any approval will advise the availability of capital funding for the project. The prison must remain operational during the redevelopment, and it will be a combination of operational need and capital availability which will determine the timeline for the work. If approval is given and funding is made available, NIPS would plan to commence work at McGilligan in 2016. Mr. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I welcome the Minister's recommitment again to the McGilligan project. Uh, but given that uh, in June 2012 the outline of state strategy was, was um, released, then last year the strategic outline case in June of 2013 was released. Uh, does the Minister think that the outline business case should actually be with the Department for Finance and Personnel? immediately in order for them to respond to that, rather than him saying that he couldn't guarantee anything without the approval of the Department for Finance and Personnel? Well, I'm sure, Mr. Speaker, that Mr. Campbell's colleague, Mr. Hamilton, would take it ill if I were to suggest that it should be entirely up to DOJ to approve our own outline business cases. The reality is there are procedures which have to be gone through. The OBC will be with DFP within the next month, as I have said and the challenge will be to ensure that we have the kind of funding which has just been spoken about by the Minister for Health to deal with some very urgent priorities in justice as well as in health. Uh, could I ask the Minister uh, about an update on the work of the stakeholder group uh, aimed at bringing uh, McGillian closer to the local community and greater opportunities uh, for prisoners on release schemes? Well, I appreciate Mr. Oshin's question, which is, of course, one of the key factors which led to the decision to redevelop McGilligan on site. Um, I haven't been directly involved with the stakeholder group recently. I'm not quite sure what the state, state of meetings is, but there is absolutely no doubt that that commitment from local businesses and from the local councils will be a, a continuing necessity to ensure that we make the most of the opportunity to redevelop McGilligan on site and to provide the opportunities that we need, particularly for things like work placements over the coming months. But I will certainly check the record and see whether there's anything which I'm not aware of, which I will report to him if that's the case. John Dallet. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I thank the Minister for, for, for his answer, and, and I question every word he says, and he will understand why. Can the Minister put it on record once and for all that he acknowledges that McGilligan Prison is not just a place that creates employment, it's a place that gives prisoners a special chance of repatriating. And will he ensure that that's not lost by some centralisation programme worked out by economists? I'm not sure, Mr. Speaker, whether Mr. Dallas has ever accused me of misleading the House before, but he appeared to come perilously close to it just there. I am very happy to give the commitment of the Prison Service and the Department of Justice, working with the partners that I've just identified to Mr. Oshin, to follow through on the commitments that I've just given to Mr. Campbell. Now, I don't know if that is enough you know, to satisfy people, but the reality is decisions on capital funding are not decisions for my department alone. They're decisions which require funding uh, to be committed by DFP, which is why I state specifically that that issue has to be followed through. But the commitment is absolute from my department that McGilligan is where the redevelopment will be, which is contrary to the original recommendations from the prison review team. But I cannot give a commitment to capital. Uh, I'm very happy to recommend to Mr. Dallet he should ask the same question to Mr. Hamilton in September. David McElveen. Mr. McElveen. Question number two, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Parades Commission is an independent body appointed by the Secretary of State and therefore is not accountable to me. I have said before, however, that I will engage with the Commission on general issues, but not individual cases, and have already done so this year. Parading remains a contentious issue, 
and I am ready to engage with any renewed political talks which I trust will achieve success this week and next on the issue. Michael Bean. Mr. Michael Bean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the Minister uh, for his answer. And I certainly would be the last person to try and deflect him towards any specific case. However, the Minister will be aware uh, that in the inhabitants of this bench, as the Parades Commission has never really received, um, I suppose, full applause, if we could put it that way. However, this Parades Commission that we currently are working under more than any. Um, appears by what they are saying in private and then doing something in, in, different in public is causing huge frustration within the uh, Protestant Unionist community. Bearing in mind that it is police officers, that it is prison officers, uh, and, and that it is also obviously constituents of each and every one of us who are affected by poor decisions on the part of the Parades Commission. Would the Minister in that case be suggesting that in the absence of there being another show in town, um, that we do have to make sure that, uh, that, that this Parades Commission is dealt with effectively in the way that it makes its decisions? Well, Mr Speaker, there are clearly two points within what Mr McElveen has said. The one is that at the moment the Parades Commission is the only show in town and the other is that it might become not the only show in town if the five-party talks achieve something over the next couple of weeks looking towards the future. But while it is the only show in town, there is no alternative but for those of us who support the rule of law to accept the determinations of the Commission, whether appreciated or not, have the force of the rule of law, and those who parade and those who protest should do so lawfully and peacefully in all circumstances. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers up to now. Can I ask the Minister, has he taken any proactive measures to remind those who might engage in violent or disruptive actions that such behaviour will not be tolerated so that we can avoid the scenes uh, that we witnessed last year when there was great damage and great cost involved? Well, whilst I appreciate Ms McCauley's question, Mr Speaker, I'm not sure that many of those who engage in that violent and disruptive behaviour listen to me, but I thought both in comments I made out in the Great Hall a few moments ago alongside the Chief Constable and in the comments I just made in the Chamber, I made it absolutely clear my belief that everybody has a duty to act lawfully and peacefully, and all those in position of leadership should see that they use their influence as best they can. Alec Adwood. Mr Adwood. Mr. Speaker, and touching on something the Minister said, whether we like or not like the Praise Commission, whether we agree or do not agree with its determination, uh, would you accept that the only sure path over the next couple of weeks is that all parties, all organisations and all communities accept Parade Commission determinations, and that if anybody errs from that a pathway and that approach, then they are on the wrong side of democracy in Northern Ireland. Well, I entirely agree with the points which Mr Atwood has just made. Not only would anybody in those circumstances be on the wrong side of democracy, they would be on the wrong side of the law as well. Mr Elliott. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for, for those answers. And I do appreciate that the Parades Commission does not come under his, his jurisdiction. However, we have went into some detail here, to, here today. And, would the Minister be supportive of having the Parades Commission attend uh, those all-party or multi-party talks that he has just talked about to try and resolve the parading issues in those specific difficult areas? Well, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Elliott is inventive as ever. Um, I'm not sure that the Minister of Justice has any opinion on who should attend uh, particular talks, but certainly it does seem to me that the Parades Commission is willing to meet anybody and everybody. Uh, the key issue, frankly, is whether those who have responsibility in those talks are prepared to engage in finding a better way and engage without reservation and without some of the qualifications we've seen so far. Jim Allister. Mr Allister. Thank you. If the Parades Commission, in respect of her doing, again rewards violence, does the Minister, as Minister of Justice, not think he might have a role of encouraging them to review such a rewarding of violence? Mr Allister's question is based on what I regard as a false premise of rewarding violence. Raymond McCartney. Mr McCartney. Question number three. Thank you. 
Mr Speaker, the Justice Bill which was introduced in the Assembly on the 16th of June marks an important new stage in an ambitious programme of work to create a faster, fairer justice system. The main purpose of the Bill is to reshape the system to improve victims' experiences and the general effectiveness of the justice process. The Bill responds directly to a number of key recommendations in the Justice Committee's report of its inquiry into the criminal justice services available to victims and witnesses of crime. Some of the key provisions in the Bill include statutory victim and witness charters, setting out clearly the standards of service victims and witnesses can expect to receive and how they can expect to be treated by criminal justice agencies, a legal entitlement for a victim to make a statement about the impact that a crime has had on them, reform of the committal process to avoid victims having to undergo the ordeal of giving evidence twice, and the introduction of statutory case management and a number of other measures to speed up the progress of cases. I believe that these provisions, combined with other measures in the Bill to enhance public protection and to safeguard vulnerable groups, should lead to a measurable difference in victims' and witnesses' experience of the criminal justice system. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer, indeed for his acknowledgement of the role of the Justice Committee's inquiry into victims and witnesses. In relation to the Victims' Charter, is the, is the Minister satisfied that, given perhaps the, the, the demand will be made on resource, that he has enough resources to ensure that when the bill is passed by the, by the Assembly, that we will have the proper structures in place? Well, certainly in current circumstances, Mr Speaker, there is a, a very real question there from Mr McCartney about the issue of resources. I certainly believe that, in line with our commitments under the new uh, European Directive, uh, we are well on the way to having the necessary measures in place, but clearly all of these cost a degree of money. But some of the, uh, some of the proposals we've had recently, for example, the registered intermediary scheme, uh, is in a position to be expanded because it's proving so successful, and the costs of that are being absorbed within the department's budget. So I do believe that we will be continuing to make progress, but obviously we cannot give guarantees as to what the finances will be over the next few years. Kieran McCarthy. Mr. McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, welcome the bill and I do congratulate the Minister and his staff and commend the Minister for his ongoing commitment to improving the experience of victims and witnesses during their contact with the criminal justice system. But can the Minister outline any steps that he has taken or any further steps that he will take, take to improve the lot for victims in the, in the service? Well, I thank Mr McCarthy for, for that question. I suppose the two key things that immediately come to mind are both the work being done to inform victims uh, post a crime of the work being done by the single point of contact through the joined up information scheme, which is having significantly positive effects, and work which is also being done to provide alternatives to appearing in court for vulnerable victims and witnesses. And just this morning in Lisburn, I visited a new arrangement there which will allow children and vulnerable adults to give evidence outside the court building by video link, just the same as already in place in Lagenside, in Londonderry Courthouse, uh, and uh, is in the process of being also provided in Palomina. So I think those are key issues which show that a relatively modest investment is significantly enhancing the opportunities for vulnerable uh, victims and witnesses in both of those cases. Sammy Douglas. Mr. Douglas. Question number four, Mr. Speaker, please. Mr. Speaker, the Youth Justice Agency undertakes a full assessment of all young people upon referral and their education, training and employment status is recorded and assessed as part of that process. For those remanded or sentenced to custody, education staff within Woodlands Juvenile Justice Centre carry out a detailed assessment during the first three days following admission to assess levels of literacy, numeracy and ICT. Throughout the young person's time in custody, the centre will record levels of attainment in these subjects as well as vocational studies and programmes. Mr. Douglas. Can I thank the Minister for his question thus far? And could I ask the Minister what proportion of young people engaged with the youth uh, justice services is regarded as being not in education, training, or employment? And how does his department support these vulnerable young people? Well, Mr. Douglas has again asked a very pertinent supplementary, Mr. Speaker. I understand that at the moment something like 45% of young people within the Juvenile Justice Centre would be regarded as coming under the not in education, employment or training status. A key part of the work which is being done to address that is looking at the provision of learning and skills within Woodlands and obviously 
for a number of those within Woodlands at the age of 18 or shortly thereafter, they will move on to Hyde Bank Wood, where the proposals for Secure College are premised around running courses uh, through providers from the general FE sector, which can be continued when people are discharged. I note, for example, that of the, um, the relatively small sample of the first five who'd gone through the social enterprise uh, in Hyde Bank Wood, the mugshot scheme, that four of the five found either employment or training when they left, uh, which is a significantly higher proportion than we would have expected. So there is good work being done, but I acknowledge, as Mr Douglas has hinted, that there is a lot more needs to be done. Follow me, Mr. Eastwood. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer so far. And, and, and can I ask him, given the fact that the oversight uh, body talked about the progress on this issue around uh, Hyde Bank Wood being limited, uh, what work is he doing and his, his department doing to ensure that the progress is no longer limited, but it's actually real and substantive? Well, we're now expanding slightly beyond the Youth Justice Agency, but since Mr Eastwood's in more or less the same area, I'll happily uh, give some indications on that. Uh, there is a lot of work has been done to, uh, to join up the provision of education services within Hyde Bank uh, by uh, the Belfast Met is providing those courses, which is the point I've just made to Mr Douglas, enables them to continue afterwards. Uh, there's also work being done around the social enterprise area, uh, where we will shortly see a full-scale operation in catering services alongside the Mugshots enterprise. Um, I've recently uh, proved a further proposal which will see an ongoing social enterprise for uh, young men as they leave Hyde Bank Wood to be engaged in continuing activity as they go out into the community. So all of these are steps in the right direction, but given the numbers we have in custody, given their previous status, as I've just said to Mr Douglas, there's a lot more still to be done. Doris Kelly. Mrs. Kelly. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Question five, Minister. The PSNI and the Police Ombudsman have a number of protocols in place to facilitate the conduct of investigations by the Ombudsman's Office. The development and outworkings of such protocols are for the bodies concerned, as each has operational independence. If the member is referring to the protocol on the sharing of sensitive information, this was shared with the Justice Committee and noted without comment in January this year. This issue is currently the subject of legal proceedings and it would therefore not be appropriate for me to comment except to say that I understand the discussions are ongoing and I hope an agreement can be reached as soon as possible. Doris Kelly. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Minister, I'm sure you'll join with me in wishing uh, the new Chief Constable, George Hamilton, uh, the wisdom of Job, or no, the wisdom of Solomon and the patience of Job in his new role is certainly uh, uh, needed. And uh, welcome also uh, the fact that he has already met with the Ombudsman to try to avert legal action. But hopefully, Minister, you will also be of the, of the view uh, that uh, the Ombudsman's Office has the ability to ha have full accountability mechanism in place for the PSNI in regards to all actions of the police, whether past or present. Mrs Kelly is very inventive, but having just said it would not be appropriate for me to comment, I will repeat the point. I, um, I certainly will endorse her good wishes for George Hamilton as Chief Constable, uh, which I conveyed a short while ago, as I've previously done informally and did by telephone call the day he was appointed. Uh, I certainly uh, believe that the reports that I'm getting from officials and indeed from a brief part of the meeting with George Hamilton this afternoon uh, believe that there is a strong chance that there will be an agreement reached before the issue comes back to the court in September, and I hope that we would all see that as a good sign of progress and sign of a better relationship, which dealt with the very difficult issues that both agencies have to resolve. Uh, Sean Lynch. Good to can call you. Will the Minister agree that when the Ombudsman states publicly that he's been prevented from carrying out his duties, then confidence in justice policing and its relationship to the rule of law is undermined? Well, yes, Mr. Speaker, I would agree that there was a danger of that some weeks ago. I think the fact that there's been significant progress made recently suggests that that need not be the case. Tom Elliott. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, just follow on to, to the Ombudsman's office. <clears throat> I wonder would the Minister indicate if there's any intention of putting in place an appeal mechanism to any of the Police Ombudsman's reports? I must say, that gets a, a long way from the original question, Mr Speaker. The simple position is that ombudsmen within the United Kingdom are largely seen as the final point of referral. Uh, the logic of what is suggested by that question is that we'd have a sort of ombudsman of ombudsmen, but then we'd have to have an appeal mechanism against the ombudsman of ombudsmen's decisions as well. 
I do not think it is possible to work within our current system beyond the point that an Ombudsman's decision is final. Roy Banks. Mr. Banks. Question number six. My officials continue to discuss the implications of local government reform with the PSNI, the Policing Board, the Department of the Environment, Shadow Councils and other stakeholders. From a recent informal discussion, a very recent informal discussion with I'm aware that the PSNI is considering options for restructuring and I will continue to brief and they will continue to brief the Policing Board on this matter. Mr. Banks. Would the Minister acknowledge that uh, a degree of accountability which was uh, designed in our system will be difficult under the current arrangements, and I think specifically of, of the Carrick Fergus area, where it is going to be joining in the new uh, Ballymena, Larne and Carrick Fergus Super Council, yet its response officers are tasked from the Newton Abbey era, area? Would he uh, agree that it would make much, be much more beneficial if response officers did not have to be tasked from Ballymena, but perhaps were based locally in the Carrick Fergus station? Well, Mr. Speaker, though Mr. Bates may tempt me into those operational issues, I can't give a response to the latter part of his question as to what would be appropriate. I can, however, indicate, and I'm sure he'll be pleased to know, that the specific issue of Newton Abbey, Carrick Fergus, as one current police area to be split between two local councils was one of the issues which was mentioned about an hour or so ago speaking to the Chief Constable. Dominic Bradley. Um, can I ask the Minister if new boundaries were to be established, when might we expect that to happen? Thank you. It's a very good question, Mr Speaker, but the answer is ask the Chief Constable. I mean, the reality is we, we are living with eight police districts which were based on a split Belfast and the other councils as they were originally designed uh, in the plan back in about shortly after Noah came out of the ark for, you know, for seven other councils. Uh, that is the reality of where the police are. Now that they know what the, the council pattern will be from the 1st of April next year, they're fully aware both of the issues as to how districts are composed and of some of those immediate uh, border issues which for example, would affect Macrofelt Limavady, which has a shared area command, as well as Newton Abbey, uh, Carrick Fergus. But the answer to the timing question is ask the Chief Constable. Gordon Dunn. Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number seven, please. Mr. Speaker, my department stands ready to consider grant funding of the RUCGC Widows Association on receipt of an appropriate application from the association. My officials have sought to engage with the association on a number of occasions to assist in the development of their application and remain willing and available to continue to offer such support. The application for funding must, however, come from the association. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer. Can the Minister give us an assurance that all reasonable efforts will be made to facilitate such funding for what is really a very worthy cause, cause are you see widows? Well, Mr. Speaker, I can give Mr. Dunn and everybody else an assurance that all reasonable efforts have been made to make that position clear. But the reality is, because of a reclassification exercise carried out on devolution by DFP, the RUCGC Widows Association is regarded as in the private sector. The only way in which the association can be funded is by grant application, rather than by the previous method where they were simply regarded as if they had been an arm's length body of the department. And frankly, it would be more beneficial if the Widows Association would fill in the form rather than merely lobbying MLAs because nothing could be done if they don't actually fill in an application form. Leslie Green. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Minister, do you uh, recognise that um, the decision to change the status of the RUC Widows Association was discriminatory and unnecessary? Well, Mr. Speaker, no, I don't regard it as discriminatory. And it was clearly necessary because it was a DFP decision on the way policies are formulated. But it wasn't discriminatory on the basis that the department has offered to continue funding on the basis of a grant application, just as is the case for every other body outside the justice system. How many times has the department's officials knocked back an application from the Widows Association? And how many times have they sat down with them to actually explain what the officials say is wrong with the applications they've made? 
Well, Mr Speaker, I'm not aware that officials have knocked back an application, but officials have certainly referred back um, applications which were not complete and which did not convey all necessary information. And I'm aware that on a very significant number of times, there's been contact either in person or by phone between my officials and officers of the association. I repeat the point that that has been offered. It is not a matter of it being offered in the future. It has been offered on a large number of occasions, but has not been taken up by the Widows Association. Alwyn McGuinness. Uh, question number eight, Mr. Speaker. Discussions between the prison service and senior church representatives are ongoing in relation to implementing a review of chaplaincy services. On the 7th of April 2014, in response to concerns raised, NIPS identified an alternative model to the one originally proposed. This was circulated for discussion and responses have now been received from all the church bodies and it is anticipated the new model will be implemented this summer. I fully appreciate the contribution that chaplains make to supporting prisoners in custody and any changes brought about by the review of chaplaincy will aim to deliver the maximum benefit to prisoners within the resources available. Alwyn McGuinness. Thank you very much. And uh, could I thank the Minister for that uh, very helpful reply? And I think it's uh, uh, very helpful in terms of resolving this particular uh, problem. Uh, and I hope that the uh, new model, uh, which has been agreed, uh, will be up and running soon. Would the Minister assure the House that, in fact, um, there will be sufficient funding uh, in order to maintain the new model? Well, Mr. Speaker, I thank Mr. McGuinness for his compliments. I can assure him that the funding proposed for this financial year is exactly the same as in the last financial year. Given the number of cuts which have had to be made elsewhere, I think that's a fair commitment to chaplaincy services. Jim Wells. Uh, Mr Speaker, this issue has been the subject of a lean efficiency review of the firearms licensing branch by a DFP consultant and a different DFP consultant regarding the fee itself. It was then subject to a public consultation exercise. That work identified the cost of processing a firearms certificate or regranting a firearms certificate as £121 for five years. That figure of £24 per annum is based on the process time for applications and the hourly rate of staff costs. I have proposed an interim fee agreed with the PSNI and DFP of £100. Currently, therefore, the PSNI has a shortfall of some £1.8 million per annum at the present fee of £50. It was set over 10 years ago before the concept of full cost recovery was introduced. AGPO has said £196 would achieve full cost recovery in England and Wales where the cost is being reviewed. The figure in the Republic of Ireland is €80 Euro per firearm for a three-year certificate. Well, apologies to the Minister. For the first time in my life, he couldn't hear what I had to say. But certainly, with my supplementary, he will get it loud and clear. He has given us the price that it costs the police to do it. But what I want to know, what would be an economic price if it was being done in the private sector? Are we not pay those who use firearms, are they not paying for the bloated bureaucracy of listener Shara? And could it not be done an awful lot cheaper with more efficiency? Well, I do know that the review was done on the basis of ensuring the most efficient process, but with necessary processes being carried out. But, Mr. Speaker, is Mr. Wells seriously suggesting that on an issue like firearms licensing, the control of lethal weapons would be handed over to the private sector? Because that's what, that's what I heard. And I cannot understand the concept that something so vital to maintaining safety of the people of Northern Ireland yeah, yeah. would be privatised. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Order members, that includes all questions to the Justice Minister. We now move on to topical questions. And I call Brenda Hale. Mrs Hale. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Minister may well be aware that those prison service staff who left under the voluntary early retirement scheme are experiencing some difficulties in relation to their holiday entitlement. Could the Minister tell the House whether all staff who left under the scheme have received their excess holiday entitlement and those who took early retirement will receive the same payment for the excess leave as those who have remained in service? 
Mr Speaker, I, I cannot give Mrs Hale the detail of that particular personnel issue. I was aware that matters were being addressed, but I'm not sure that I can confirm that everything is entirely clarified at the moment. If she has specific issues that she wants to highlight now or later by, you know, by letter, I will certainly follow them up. Uh, Mrs Hale. I thank the Minister for his answer, and I do have specific issues that I will probably speak to you outside the Chamber about this, but I suppose I'm looking for the confirmation that you will ensure that any staff member who took their early retirement will not be unjustly penalised in relation to the payment of holiday entitlement. Well, certainly I, I can give a commitment. It is my understanding that there were a number of people who left with some holiday entitlement, and certainly whatever the civil service handbook prescribes for staff should be provided to them. If it hasn't been, I would do my best to ensure it's done very rapidly, so I'll take the details later. Well, Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister, could he provide us with an update on the new Placing and Community Safety Partnerships for the new 11 councils? Well, Mr. Speaker, the legislation provides that there will be a PCSP for each district council. It doesn't prescribe there will be 26 PCSPs. It prescribes one per council and the four subgroups for Belfast. The legislation also prescribes that PCSPs have the opportunity to set up subgroups to which they may co-opt other people, whether other councillors, not members of the principal partnership, or members of the general public. And if there are issues where people feel there's a need for local representation, I would trust that's something that the new PCSPs after the 1st of April next year will address using the legislation that currently exists for that purpose. Follow Brad. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Can I ask the Minister, I know he talked about subgroups there, but has he considered changing the leg legislation to increase the, the, the number of people who sit on the PCSPs, which is currently 19 for the present uh, councils, given that we're going into larger council areas? No, consideration has not been given to that point at this stage, Mr. Speaker, um, given that there is an issue about uh, ensuring that bodies don't become excessively large, especially when you think it isn't actually 19, but by the time you, you add the other members, you know, you're potentially maybe adding from between the, the minimum uh, numbers and up to 10 or 12 in some cases potentially. So you do have the potential that the overall partnership of a new district could be in the region of 30 membership. Um, if members wish to suggest that as part of the review, we could certainly look at that. But at this stage, I, you know, I believe the numbers are probably right it might be that if we'd looked at this, we might have had slightly bigger numbers, but I doubt whether we'd want to see it significantly bigger. I think the issue that's also being raised and with some concerns is the issue of local subgroups, and that really can be addressed within the existing legislation. Dominic Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Can I ask the Minister a question uh, regarding the police ombudsman's report into the murder of Sergeant uh, Joe Campbell of the RUC? Is the Minister concerned that attempts to frustrate the Ombudsman's investigation through the systematic destruction of evidence? Well, I need to be very careful, Mr Speaker, um, especially as Sergeant Campbell was murdered long before I came into office and under very different circumstances as to exactly what I say. And certainly the first thing I would wish to say is to record my sympathy for Sergeant Campbell's family with what they are currently having to go through because of the republicity. It would be a matter of concern if in any circumstances evidence was being destroyed that could lead to an investigation. But of course there are other factors, other factors such as the compelability of witnesses where there is a division in this House as to whether it's possible to make progress in that area, which would also be an issue of concern to some people. Mr. Brown. Well, just on that point, would the Minister agree with me that there is no need for legislation to ensure that retired members of the RUC uh, cooperate with the Ombudsman's investigations? Well, um, Mr Speaker, I have a paper before the Executive looking at the issue of uh, a number of matters relating to the Ombudsman's work, including the issue of compelability of retired police officers. Um, it's fairly clear that there is as yet no political consensus, and therefore it's unlikely any such legislation would pass this House. But I can certainly see why members of families like the Campbell family would wish to see full compelability. We do also have to acknowledge that when we're going back so far, in many cases, uh, there might be no valid evidence forthcoming in such circumstances, but it's entirely understandable why people would wish to explore that. Jerry Kelly. Mr. Kelly. Uh, the Minister will be aware of reports uh, recently in the paper that the, ombudsman requested, the police ombudsman requested 1.1 million 
uh, from the uh, department and that the minister has refused this in terms of uh, conflict related uh, complaints and I asked the question could he explain to the House why and especially since the minister and others are going into talks trying to deal with a comprehensive uh, uh, trying to deal with this issue of legacy in a comprehensive way well, I certainly agree with Mr. Kelly. There is a need to look at these issues in a comprehensive way. But the reality is we also have to look at the budget which is available. There is no point in promising money which cannot be delivered. And I do think part of the issue needs to be to see whether we can get a coherent joined-up way for dealing with all the issues of the past, because it's quite clear that there are issues which could be better done by uh, something like a legacy unit than by the historic inquiries of the Ombudsman's Office, by some elements of a legacy inquest, and indeed by the work of the HET. So let's see what we can get from those five-party talks in the first place. Mr. Kelly. Um, I thank the Minister for his answer so far. But alongside that, with respect, uh, he is the Minister. These requests are being done before we have come to a conclusion in terms of these talks. So, and he did mention the inquest. So let me add to that. Uh, is the minister happy that resources are available? Because there are also uh, reports in the paper that uh, there isn't enough uh, resources being given for proper disclosure uh, to a number of these inquests. Well, and again, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Kelly highlights significant issues relating to resources in the context where the Department of Justice has a budget for dealing with the present and has responsibilities for dealing with the past. No other department is in that position. And that is the challenge that we, we face, in particular in the difficult financial circumstances that are looming because of the inability to agree welfare reform. It's impossible to make commitments to fund some of those services from the past. Colum Eastwood. Mr Eastwood. Uh, thank you. Mr Speaker, can I ask the, the Minister if he agrees with me that the only way to avoid uh, some of the criminal justice issues that have come out of uh, some issues surrounding controversial parades. The only way to deal with that is for uh, people to get round the table in the same way that happened in Derry and to talk the issue out and to ensure that we can have respect and tolerance right across the board. I'm certainly very happy to agree uh, between a, an MLA for Foil asking the question and an MLA for Foil sitting in the Speaker's chair that, that there are clearly positive examples that have come when people from Derry and people from London Derry got together and discussed those issues. The challenge is to get that kind of mood into areas like North Belfast, where it is sadly lacking. But I certainly would hope that the leadership which is available in this House would provide some of that joining up. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And further to that, the minister, was the Minister glad today to see that the House unanimously supported uh, a motion that called for the unambiguous adherence to the rule of law uh, around some of these issues? Well, yes, indeed. I'm not sure whether Mr Eastwood was in at an early stage of question time when I repeated that point that I have made on a number of occasions. It is absolutely necessary that, that everybody in the community accepts determinations of the Praise Commission and accepts them as having the, the force of the rule of law, which they do. And it is absolutely important that those who wish to parade and those who wish to protest both do it entirely lawfully and entirely peacefully. Order, members. Ian McRae, not in his place. Gregory Campbell. Mr Campbell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Whenever the Minister is uh, progressing major capital work schemes, like, for example, prisons, how long would it normally take an outline business case to be transferred to the Department of Finance and Personnel? I think, Mr Speaker, the answer to that is it depends upon the complexity of the particular capital scheme in question. Campbell. <laughs> Well, I thank the Minister for the vagueness of that reply, and if we could maybe get it down to a more precise nature now. The Minister caused some uncertainty three weeks ago when he answered my honourable friend, uh, saying that there was no guarantee for the President McGilligan to proceed. And at that point, he did not mention that his department had not proceeded to put an outline business case to the Department of Finance and Personnel. Thankfully, he's done that today. Can I explain why he didn't mention it three weeks ago and did mention it today? Uh, maybe in the context of a prepared answer to the question, Mr. Speaker, it was easier to get the full detail into the question. Uh, Mr. Campbell appears to be suggesting that I'd somehow been covering up what is happening. There is a lengthy and complex process, which he indeed, at a non-topical question a few moments ago, outlined in terms of strategic business case and outline business case and all the details that have to be worked through. 
I didn't think that that was any secret to members of this House, especially not to members who had themselves been ministers in the past. Yeah. Uh, can I ask, Minister, how do you respond to criticism levelled against your department uh, by solicitors for the most senior coroner uh, that the lack of resources allocated to legacy issues is indeed an enormous embarrassment to the state? Well, as I've just said to other members of this House, Mr. Speaker, it is absolutely clear that there are fundamental issues of resources. Issues like uh, obtaining all the necessary information for inquests are enormously complex, are enormously demanding of time and skilled personnel, of whom there are a limited number. And the reality is that there have been difficulties encountered in doing that. That has never been denied. What is an issue is to ensure that we provide the system in as joined up a way as possible. But that would best be done if we could agree on some of the outstanding issues of the past and find some ways in which collectively we could deal with them without using the existing inquest system to deal with legacy matters which are more complex and which aren't easily uh, carried through by implementing the standard system for today. Boy. Uh, Minister, uh, to ensure that families do get to the truth, how do you explain the shock and lack of resources uh, to families such as that of Roseanne Mallon, a led, an elderly lady from my own county uh, that was shot dead some 20 years ago and whose family are still waiting for answers uh, around her death? Gormogut. Well, Mr Speaker, I don't accept there's a shocking lack of resources. There are very significant resources being put into dealing with legacy inquests, but given the complexity, given the work which is required, given the limited number of people with the capacity to do that, these things are taking time at the moment, and unless we find some better way of dealing with this, unless we find experts who we do not currently have access to, then it will continue to be a major issue. We are well aware of the difficulties that arise from that. I am aware of the recent uh, court settlements or court decisions in the, in the context of those uh, who believe that they suffered as a result of delays, and we are doing what we can to address that. But I'd be very foolish to stand here and promise that things could be done, which we simply don't have the resources and the expertise in the numbers that we need to deal with everything as fast as we would wish. Order, members. David McElveen, not in his place. Fergal McKinney. Mr. McKinney. Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Given, the, given recent public concerns over the SAI process and health service investigation, does the Minister feel that an amendment uh, to the current Legal Aid and Coroner's Courts Bill to allow for independent investigation would be within the scope of the Bill? Um, I'm not sure whether it would be within the scope of the Bill, Mr. Speaker. Mr. McKinney makes a, an interesting point, but the reality is the scope of that particular Bill is the extremely narrow scope. Um, certainly there is an issue which is being looked at within the Department of wider reform of coronial law, and I believe that's where it would best sit. So, by what mechanism would that be introduced and could it be? Mr Speaker, that would be on the basis of a wider bill looking at coronial law in general, and I think there are a number of factors which need to be taken into account. Um, it's, I, I know it's an issue which has been suggested by the Attorney General that we should look at this particular point. I think the difficulty is in dealing with matters piecemeal rather than looking at a single piece of legislation which would deal with a number of outstanding issues around coronial law, but it is an issue which is being actively explored within the Department at present. Members, that includes question time. Can I ask how to take his ease as we change the top table?